Well, good morning, everybody. How are you today? Thumbs up if you're absolutely fantastic. I am. I don't know. How are you? How are you feeling? Two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. <laughs> That's great. My name is Allie DePew. I'm with Inspired Classroom. And this is Craig Jordanay. He is the big game researcher and also hunter extraordinaire um, and sort of facilitator here at MPG Ranch. How are you doing, Craig? Good. How are you? Awesome. I am doing so good. We are here to talk to you about elk. And I believe elk is a big game animal. Correct. <laughs> it is. So what we're going to do is do just as we're getting started and his friends are moving in, um, I'm going to have Craig tell us a little bit about MPG Ranch. Um, and then we're going to jump into talking about elk, uh, the natural history. We're going to talk a little bit about his research, he brought some pretty cool things to show and to share with us. So we'll talk a lot about what his research is and what he does. Um, but the most important thing is that we're hoping this is going to be a conversation between Craig and all of you. And so if you have questions or comments, um, because there's a lot of us, let's go ahead and type them in the chat. You can also you can also unmute your microphone if you would like to do that. Um, but I think we'll be able to get to more if we are able to type them into the chat. So anytime you have a question, go ahead and put that in the chat and I will read that out to Craig. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Craig. Craig, tell us a little bit about this incredible place sure. that we're standing in. Valley, which is good south of Missoula, Montana. So the Sapphire Mountains are to my left, and the Bitter Mountains are to my right. And this ranch is about 16,000 acres, and it used to be a traditional cattle uh, ranch. They, they grew wheat here. Uh, the family was a traditional ranching family, and then they sold it about 2009. And the owner of the ranch today uh, actually converted this ranch into what we call a conservation ranch. So they removed the livestock. They began to um, restore the native vegetation, a lot of the right shrubs and trees that used to be in the creek bottoms that were no longer um, as plentiful, started to kind of um, just work on trying to make this ranch healthier and uh, and uh, more native as far as the vegetation and those kind of things. So today it's MPG Ranch, a conservation ranch. And um, and uh, so we work, uh, the owner supports research on the ranch, everything from butterflies to black bears, all kinds of different research projects and things are happening on this ranch. So it's really a active, uh, really a cool place to work. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so I'm curious. Um, how many of you have well have have has anybody ever seen an elk? You can show me with like a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Oh, I'm seeing lots and lots of thumbs up. I'm seeing some thumbs down. Has anybody ever seen a has anybody seen a picture of an elk? Do we know what an elk looks like? Yep, I'm we definitely know what elk look like. Okay. Um I would love to hear where everybody's from. If you want to type in the chat, just what classes we have in that way, um, we can, we can kind of see and we can talk to you about elk in your area as well as elk on MPG ranch. So we have probably about 14, 14, 14 classes in this morning, Craig, from all over Montana. We've got, oh, we've got Illinois. Um, we've got some Hamilton. We can wave down at Hamilton. Let's give them a wave, Craig. They're just on the bitter route from us. Fairfield High School, Missoula, Hamilton. Oh, this is fantastic. Rochester, New York. Oh, man, this is so cool. And nobody has ever seen an elk. So I wonder if what we need to do first is maybe start with, I'm just going to show you a little a, a picture of an elk to begin with, because I think that might be the first thing to help us start thinking about this. Um, as I'm getting this up, will you tell a little bit about the elk that are on this ranch? Like, do we have elk on the ranch? We do have elk on the ranch and we actually have a fair number. Uh, they don't stay here all the time. They move a pretty big landscape, but um, we have between four and 600 elk that's been uh, part of their review here on the ranch. And so, they share this with 
white-tailed deer, mule deer, which are all the same part of the deer family. We have moose. Uh, we have all kinds of predators like black bear. We even have some grizzly bear and uh, mountain lions. And so we got a lot of different species of wildlife here on the ranch that are neighbors and buddies with the elk. <laughs> Awesome. So what we're looking at right now is this is a picture of a bull elk. Um, and Craig, how do you tell the difference between a bull elk and a cow elk? And what what is a bull elk versus a cow elk? When you talk about female elk, uh, we refer to those as cow elk. And when you talk about male elk, we, we call those bull elk. And so the biggest difference uh, is that the, the bulls grow antlers. Uh, they grow antlers through spring, through the fall, and then they shed those antlers in the winter time. That's why we call them antlers. Antlers are different than horns. The animals that grow horns and sheep and bison, they maintain that horn throughout their whole life. But uh, the deer family that has antlers, they actually grow these through the course of uh, kind of the growing the uh, spring through fall. And then they shed these antlers every year in the winter time, and then they grow a new set every year. So, so what are, what is this? That's an antler. And who? What animal does this belong to? Is this a deer antler? Well, that's a mature. <laughs> this is this would be an antler off uh, a bull elk that would be, you know, in that five to six, seven years old. So this is kind of a mature antler for a bull elk. So this weighs about seven or eight pounds, and so they have two of these. And um, so there's a little bit of weight that they throw around through the course. I was just thinking that as I was holding this up to my head because they kind of go, if I had it, something sort of like that, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Like that's really heavy. Yeah. I can't imagine yeah. having this on my head, let alone two of these on my head. Like that's really, really heavy. Well, it talks to kind of how big an elk is and how big their muscles are. <laughs> This kind of thing up. But you can see right where it kind of fastens into part of the skull, it's fairly smooth, but that's where it breaks off from the skull. And then actually just they shed it and it just falls to the ground and um, and then they start to grow a new set. And so it's actually some of the fastest known growth of bone is these is the growth of antlers on, on deer uh, and elk and moose. Um, so it's pretty fantastic that they are able to do that. There's a lot of energy and nutrition that goes into growing these. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, and we can get into that a little later. Yeah, let's get into that a little bit later. So I, there are, are a couple of questions. Is an elk a deer? Elk is a deer. It's a member of the deer family. So moose, white-tailed deer, mule deer in our area, these are all members of the deer family. Yes, but it is different than just a deer, like it's it's a little bit different than a deer. Different than a deer, yeah. Common name for mule deer, white-tailed deer, they are different species of animals uh, than the elk. So the closest relative to an elk is like the red deer that you, that you find in, in Europe. Okay, okay, that's great. So how old can an elk get? Like how, how what's the lifespan of an elk? An elk can actually get old enough to vote. But, uh, do they get mail-in ballots or do they have to go to the polling place <laughs> got it <laughs> it's a little bit different with bull elk versus cow elk because bull elk end up they're really active and aggressive during the rut and so their lifespan is probably a little shorter than a cow elk typically if they were just able to live naturally to the end of their life so a bull elk, an old bull elk would be 12, 14 years old. That would be a pretty old bull elk. But we have cow elk that we know of that have lived past 20 years. Oh, wow. So what's cool about that is cow elk are actually, they remain fertile throughout the course of their life. And so they can actually produce a calf through uh, their entire lifetime. That's great. So you, you, you talked about something that I want to get back to in a little bit, but Hold on to the thought about the rut, because that's something that I think a lot of people have heard of, and maybe we need to clarify just a little bit. Um, so how strong are elk? Like, I mean, we just, I think part of it is we just 
learned that that antler weighs about eight pounds. So two of those are about 16 pounds. I mean, that you have to be pretty strong to carry that around and then be able to run with it. So how do you measure the strength of an animal? That's a great question. I think the, the little bull elk, a mature bull elk can weigh in the neighborhood of 800 pounds. Wow. Cow elk is probably more around that 600 pound range. So they're just, they're big and they have big muscles and they, you can look at the country that they have to move around in. And so that gives you an indication too of having that large of a body and having to be able to carry that through all these mountains. And the, and so, you know, the fact that they carry some pretty large antlers gives you an indication too that there's some strength there. But when you watch them, and we'll, again, we'll talk about the rut, but when you see them fighting and pushing each other around, you can tell there's a lot of strength behind, uh, behind that weight, uh, that body weight. Okay, so we have some antler questions. I think we'll we'll, we'll stay on the antler the antler antler track here for a few minutes. So, um, when do they shed their antlers? In the deer family, it's all a little bit different depending on a species. And uh, but for elk, they start maybe the more mature elk, older bull elk will start toward the end of February, and then they'll shed them all the way through uh, the month of March, maybe even into early April. And uh, and shortly after they shed, uh, you can start to even see the new growth uh, begin on, on a lot of those antlers. And so they time it about the time you start to see some new green growth going on. So it's all this is sort of related to nutrition and how well they're able to access um, the green forage that's that's has the highest nutrition. For them. Oh, interesting, interesting. So you don't want to be growing growing your antlers in the middle of winter when when you're really struggling to find find food to eat. <laughs> Grow as large an antler as you can because that is really helpful for all kinds of different things uh, in your life if you're a bull elk. And so uh, you want to try to grow those antlers when you're getting good nutrition out of the forage that's available. So, um, so there's not, it's not a coincidence that, you know, they're growing these antlers at a time when they have good nutrition. Oh, that's great. Well, what, okay. We're going to, we're going to come back to antlers, but what do elk eat? Cause that's a question that I've seen a couple of times in the chat. Research around the ranch here, elk are primarily grazers and they call them grazers because they, most of their diet is typically grass. And so uh, they'll eat forbs like little flowering plants too. And, and when, in different areas, they'll, they'll turn to shrubs as well. But we know that like around here in some of the research we've done, they'll eat 60 or 70 different species of plants within the course of a year. So there's, it's like you going to a buffet and having all this food available there. There are certain things that you like the most and you'll eat a lot of that, but then you need other kinds of food to kind of round out your diet. And so you see elk doing that and they're very adaptable. Elk can live in a lot of different places from the prairie all the way up into the mountains here. So uh, in Montana, we have them throughout the whole state. That's great. That's great. Um, where did you where did you get those antlers from and how how big can these grow? And what's the biggest antler you've ever seen? <laughs> these so these were just when i was hiking around uh you know where they shed the antlers you know in the early spring uh people actually go out looking for them i actually just found them laying on the ground um several years ago it's common for people to go out and actually look for them but this is uh i would say this is a typical average size antler for a mature bull elk wow I'm guessing that some of the bigger ones that I've seen are almost twice this size. So they grow to be pretty massive. Uh, uh, so it's, this is a, but this is a good representative antler and uh, on a mature bull elk, most of them will grow six points. So that's pretty typical for, for bull elk that are six to eight years old to kind of have that many points. And so a point is, one of the spikes on the antler. These are all tines. Uh, we just call them a six point bull. That would be kind of what this would be on both sides. And usually they're pretty symmetrical, meaning both sides 
tend to look pretty close to the same, but you can also get some really abnormal growth with antlers that are pretty goofy. <laughs> and, uh, they look, uh, they have points grown off to the side or sometimes the antlers look like they were grown on a really hot day, like they melted into some kind of odd shape. And so there's all kinds of different antler growth that you see, but those are more uncommon than common. Oh, that is so great. Okay. Um, I can't even, we have so many questions. This is so fantastic, Craig. <laughs> There's some people are really, really curious. Um, oh, this is interesting. I want, I want you to go with this one. Can you explain the advantage? And this is going to answer another question that another student have as well. So can you explain the advantage of having antlers versus horns? So maybe just start with the difference again between the two. Um, this is from Mr. Laggy's class. I believe he's, I believe they're in Fairfield. Um, and they say it takes a lot of energy to grow new antlers every year. So it's probably hard on them to obtain all the nutrition, all those nutrients. So if they had horns, they would only need to do it once. So why? <laughs> Good question, Mr. Laggy's class. <laughs> Expert in animal behavior and those kind of things. But one of the things that we know about elk, for example, is that um, the bigger their antlers, the more successful they are in the whole breeding season thing. And so, and plus there's a hierarchy within the deer family that the larger antlers you have, typically the more dominant, the more aggressive, um, you're, you're, you're higher up in the hierarchy compared to other bulls. And so that's kind of a big deal when you're in the deer family. And, uh, that makes life a little easier for you. So the idea that they grow antlers versus horns is, is really an interesting one because um, I think they communicate a lot different than animals with horns. And so antlers tend to, um, there's a degree which an animal can look at one another and, and begin to kind of gauge sort of a little bit of their dominance, you know, say, looking at the at the antlers. Why they grow antlers versus horns is just a great question. And I think from an evolution standpoint, um, those animals that grow horns probably don't have to have near as much energy put into that horn growth as, as animals that have antlers. And so that energy goes into some other things. But uh, that's a good question. And I don't probably have a <laughs> wonderful answer for you with that. It kind of makes it's one of the things to me that makes wildlife so interesting to study because they're all so very different. That's awesome. So how aggressive can they be with these antlers? Maybe we talk a little bit about what these antlers are used for. <laughs> well, they can be super aggressive. I think what we find and it's kind of true with people too when you think about two people that are maybe in an argument or they're kind of uh, have conflict with one another is there's ways that they communicate and posture themselves to kind of prevent a full-blown fight because you don't really want to get into a full-blown fight because you have a chance of being injured. And in some cases, uh, when we've had that documented here on the ranch, they can actually um, uh, kill each other. And so, um, you don't want to resort to that every time you have a conflict. And so um, there's ways that they communicate and do body posturing when they get into those kind of aggressive things that oftentimes one will back off, but when they don't, they can't actually get into fights. And fights are really different than sparring because you'll see bull elk, they sort of practice fighting like a boxer's in a ring where they get into the ring to practice with one another called sparring. Well, it's not really serious. They're just kind of going through the motions. And they might lock antlers with each other, push each other around a little bit, but it's not really aggressive. But fights become really aggressive and you can become actually pretty violent. And what happens is if a, if a closing bull elk makes a mistake or moves in a way that the other bull is able to get them onto the ground, uh, knock them off their feet, uh, oftentimes that bull elk that's um, that's standing above the other one will actually try to injure it and in some cases kill the other bull. So it can be pretty serious. 
and it can be kind of jaw droppingly violent too when you watch it. Okay, we have some we have some um, logistical questions here. How do they sleep with those antlers, and how do they not get tangled up when they're walking through the forest with those antlers? <laughs> times when you see all uh they often are they bed down so that they're laying on the ground but their head is usually up unless they're super tired and then sometimes you'll see them just lay their head down you know with their chin down on the ground um so it's really a good question uh, and you know uh as far as moving through the timber and those kind of things i think they just learn. And one of the things we haven't talked about is how these antlers actually grow. And the fact that they're covered with this um, kind of fuzzy tissue called velvet. And that velvet has blood vessels in it and that supplies all the nutrients and stuff to the growing antler, which is actually bone. But that's really sensitive. And so even any anything that's actually touching that velvet, they can really feel that. And so you learn how to kind of navigate through the trees, just like if you had antlers on you every day and you had to get to school and do all the things you did with an antler on your head, you'd learn over time kind of what you could do and what you couldn't do. And so they, they just kind of figure that stuff out. And a lot of time what you'll see is they put their, when they do move through the trees, they'll put their nose up. So their antlers kind of sweep back behind them like that. And they're able to kind of to manage getting through the timber that way and they'll put them side to side as they move through the trees. It's pretty interesting to watch. Okay, so here's a couple of questions that are follow-ups on that. Um, so they wanted to know if there was blood supply to the antlers and it is, and it's, it sounds like it's almost on the, is it on the outside or it's on the outside? Okay, and how, how, so one of the questions was how are there blood cells in the antlers? And so, maybe talk a little bit just about how that growth how that like what what's happening there so, it's, so there, that velvet is actually um supplying the growth of this is actually bone it's just if you if i knock on it it'll be just like a leg bone or something like that and so that's that's carrying all the nutrients into the antler the antler is kind of soft at that point it's not firm. and so what happens is it begins to grow out the top of the head, but this is the first part of the antler that actually starts to develop. And as it grows, then it begins to grow these other tines. So this is actually the last part of the antler that actually, um, this is the newer growth of the antler versus down here. And then that velvet will, about middle of August, it starts to dry up and it gets um, just like skin getting really dry and begins to peel off the antler. And what they do then, these bulls are kind of starting to be the early part of the rut. They're getting a little bit aggressive. And so then they start to rub these antlers on trees and shrubs and things and- Like this? Yes, Allie, that's exactly <laughs> it. This is actually a tree that I just <laughs> I cut off because it's a great example of, of what a bull elk does to a tree when they start rubbing it. On, on antlers and shrubs. And so most of that bark is missing. So bring happened, this up close. It is actually just colored. It's quite kind of chalky color at the tip of the antlers like that. That's the actual color of the antler as it sheds its velvet. But when it starts to rub on trees, bark and shrubs, and that's what gets this brown color to the antler. And so it's really kind of a process. And um, again, it's a fascinating fascinating thing that they put a lot of energy into oh that is so great okay I, i'm gonna do we're gonna do a rapid fire session are you ready how fast can an elk run <laughs> yeah, close 25 30 miles an hour on a dead sprint <laughs> dead sprint that's, that's a guess. yeah how tall do they get boy an elk, uh, I bet an elk, if it was standing next to me, the weather, so the top of the shoulders would probably be right about here on me. All right. Yeah. So about five, five, four and a half to five? Yeah. Five might be a little much, but okay. four and a half for sure. What month do they give birth? 
great question. And in this part of Montana, in the Bitter Valley, we know that the peak of, of birth time is about June 1st. June 1st, okay. You weigh about, so if you're a newborn calf, elk calf, you weigh about 35, 40 pounds. How, wow, that's a large, that's a big baby. <laughs> how many, how many calves are born at once? Uh, elk typically will have a single calf. Okay. They occasionally can have twins, but that's pretty uncommon. But for other members of the deer family, like white-tailed deer can, you know, twins are really common. Yeah. And moose on good, really good habitat, twins are pretty common. But elk typically will have one calf. One calf. Do they dig with their antlers? I You, you don't see them dig with their antlers, but part of this coloration and how, why these tips end up being white instead of brown is that a lot of times, again, bulls during the rut will get really agitated and they'll they'll put their antlers down into the ground and kind of, you know, just kind of an aggressive kind of thing and, and get their tines down into the dirt and, and move them around. But they typically don't use their antlers to dig for any, to dig. any other reason. I have a question. Do they use it to move snow? They don't. I've never really seen them use their antlers for snow for dig. Yeah. They usually, are they're paw. They paw. Okay. And so they'll. You see a lot of times when the snow is a little deeper, they'll actually paw down to areas where they can feed. Yeah. Okay. How far can they travel in a day? They can move. <laughs> Tens of miles, I would say, really easy. Um, we, we've actually had from some of the research elk that have worn these radio collars, and so we can follow where they go. Uh, but some elk migrate um, dozens and dozens of miles from where they spend the winter to where they calve and spend the summer. Yep. So they can move. If they, if they want to move, they can move. And 10 miles, 15 miles in a day, 20 miles in a day would not be unusual they got four legs and they can really they can cover ground i love it okay we've got a question about the ranch and elk um it seems like our the ranch like that we're in a very wide open area so how much habitat do we have on the ranch and how many elk are there um are there any nearby us now <laughs> we have elk within a mile of us today uh, we were actually kind of looking when we were setting up for class today, and I didn't see any elk, but it wouldn't be unusual at all. But this is still kind of the tail end of the rut, and they make bull elk have a call that we call a bugle, and we could probably hear it from where we're at with where the elk are at today. Um, but we have, so in the winter time, elk tend to kind of move and concentrate more because they have less ground they can access because of deep snow. So we'll have four to six hundred elk on the ranch um, at that time. up here too. And this time of year, don't really have snow, and there's still a lot of forage they can access. They they range pretty wide, and so uh, we don't have that many elk on us today. Uh, they can be spread all over this landscape. But we have elk that actually live in the river bottom down below us most all year. We have other elk that migrate or move all the way back to the higher mountains and ridges in the summertime. So they're pretty adaptable and um, elk have different strategies for trying to make a living. So some migrate, some don't. And the ranch itself is about 1,600, 16,000, not 100, 16,000, excuse me, 16,000 acres. So there's a lot of room to roam. Um, how many, wow, how many pounds of food do they need to eat each day? You know a lot about elk and their diet. And um, the way that I would say this is, so if you took the forage that they consumed in a day and you dried it, which is sort of a way of standardizing the weight because all plants have different amounts of water and so they all weigh a little different, but they've taken the amount of forage that an elk eats in a day and then dried it out. And we get about 12 to 13 pounds of air dried. Wow. So uh, an animal that weighs six to 800 pounds. If you think about a horse, you, um, you know, you probably, if people are feeding hay to horses, you're thinking about 20, 25 pounds a day, I think. And 
So elk are kind of that 12 to 13 pounds a day. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done any research on predators and which speci with uh, specific to elk um, and which elk they target? So in other words, are big antlers a good deterrent to predatory attacks? One of the things that, yeah, um, Ellie, you call me back into this because I'll... Okay, but, I think you, this is an area you really enjoy talking about. <laughs> there's, there's been a lot of research done on predation. I've actually been involved in some of that in the general. Um, I'll talk about that first and then kind of how antlers might play into that. But So we know that, uh, so we radio tag about over the course of four or five years, 250 elk calves with little radio tags in their ear. And what we want them to do is see when that elk stopped moving, uh, what was what was killing that cow, that, that, that elk. And so in the bitter, uh, the primary source of uh, mortality on elk calves was mountain lions. Mm -hmm. And black bears prey on, on newborn calves. Uh, wolves prey on calves, but they usually tend to wait until they get bigger into the winter time before they pursue them. And so there's all these different predators that kind of act on elk calves and, and are certainly predators of them. And so here, of all the elk calves that are born in the spring, about half of them are, um, suffer mortality, usually to predation and maybe some other things like natural causes. They try to cross a river in the spring when the water's really high and they don't make it, those kind of natural things. And so about you can expect about half of those calves uh, in this part of the world that are born in the spring to not make it to their to their first winter. So, and then winter time is another time when mortality uh, predation on elk calves is pretty tough. But once they make it through that first year, their survival goes up pretty substantially. And so, the predation and all those kind of things um, aren't near as impactful when they get to be older and adults. Um, Probably some pretty good debate and discussion about how antlers play into that. Are they actually weapons that bulls use to fend off predators? And a lot of what we see when we watch wolves and other animals try to take elk down is that they don't really tend to use those antlers until right, you know, if they're really cornered and it's kind of the last of the of the chase, they may put their head down and try to use antlers a little bit as a weapon, but they don't seem to be a huge uh, deterrent uh, as far as predation for, for lions and wolves and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, okay, are babies born with antlers? Babies are not born with antlers. They go, um, in fact, um, Allie, there's a little progression of antler growth there if we want to talk about that. Oh, yeah. This little guy. Okay, let's grab these guys. Thank you. Sure. So, a calf, male calf is born without antlers. So, the first entire year without antlers, and then it's when it's about a year old, it begins to grow its first set of antlers. And usually, uh, this is all they grow the first year. So kind of a spike. We call that just a spike. It's a yearling bull. Then the second, when they're about two years old, they begin to grow their second set of antlers. And this is about the size of a typical two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old bull. So you can go see they go from that to this. And then in a couple of years after that, <laughs> they grow more into something that looks like it. So um, they continue to get longer kinds and heavier antlers until they're in that six to eight, 10 year old, and then they start to actually regress. So as they get older, um, their tines begin to shorten up, and the amount that each antler weighs tends to kind of drop as they get older. Yeah. Part of that is because <laughs> as they age, their teeth wear. And as their teeth wear, they can't process forage uh, as efficiently as they could when the, you know, the points and the ridges of the teeth were sharp. You mean it's hard to chew? It gets hard to chew and they don't make dentures for elk. Oh man. I know. <laughs> so they begin to wear and get pretty smooth. And then the animal begins to kind of start to go downhill because they can't 
uh, maintain that nutritional level that are doing with the better, more efficient teeth. Are there different types of elk in the United States or are they all the same species? Different subspecies of elk. <clears throat> so you have the Tool or Tule elk in California. You have the Roosevelt Belt elk that's kind of on the Pacific coast, uh, Oregon, Washington. And we have the Rocky Mountain elk here in Montana. <laughs> Awesome. Um, are they endangered? They're not endangered. In fact, they're very common. And we actually have a challenge here throughout the Western U.S. and a lot of places of trying to manage their numbers because they're, in some cases their numbers are too great. They have impacts on private land that they can really have uh, a lot of uh, negative impact on private land where they're trying to grow crops and trying to raise livestock and so that's one of the challenges with elk management today is, is trying to get them into a, a population level that, that is within the tolerance of the people that are trying to make a living and on the land. And that's what I'd say, Ali, is that's really in contrast to when my great grandparents were alive, for example, in the early 1900s, there was very few elk on the landscape here at that time. And there was a lot of grassroots effort by a lot of people to try to restore big game populations in Montana. And they were very successful at doing that. Mm -hmm. Today, we experience populations that were are far, far higher than they were back in the early 1900s. Wow. Are people allowed to hunt on the ranch? Um, and are any type of animal, uh, does, are there any type of animal management rules associated with that? Use public hunting as a management tool here on the ranch, just like in a lot of places in really here. And we primarily ask hunters to harvest cow elk. So that's the most effective way to, to manage a population is by trying to harvest the animals that are actually producing calves. And so we'll harvest hunters that come onto the ranch, harvest about 30 to 40 uh, cow elk a year. And um, we have neighbors that that allow hunting too. And so between all of us, we're trying to kind of hold this population to keep it from growing any higher than it is now. In fact, we'd like to actually uh, decrease the number of elk that are spending uh, their lives here on the ranch. Yeah, okay. So we have a couple of questions um, about how old they get. And we sort of touched on that, but then also um, do they get sick and what makes them sick? And then also, do they uh, struggle with chronic wasting disease and brucellosis? Uh, great questions. Elk do get sick. They do get injured. There are things just like people uh, that, that they have to deal with in everyday life. And so there are different diseases that impact elk more than some other animals. We do not have chronic wasting disease in this part of the state that we know of. Uh, we actually test uh, the elk every year that we harvest just to double check and, and, and keep monitoring that. We don't have brucellosis is not a, an issue here in this part of the state either, so we're fortunate that way. But uh, elk can break legs. Uh, they can have things happen to their digestive, digestive system. They can break a jaw because of getting kicked or whatever through the bulls we've had again we've had a couple of bulls die this this fall because they were gored by another bull elk and so there's life stuff and um, uh, just because you don't get preyed upon by a predator doesn't mean you're going to live a, a fruitful <laughs> happy life a lot of things out here that can go wrong and so you really have to respect the fact that you see these animals on landscape and just understanding what they go through from a daily basis to survive. It's a, it's a, I don't know, an amazing thing to see. Okay, so um, that's, yeah, that's wonderful. We've had, let's see, a couple questions about, let's see where, if, if I can find one of the, in one in particular. Okay, well, we'll just go with this. We've had some questions about what type of noise do elk make and do they do they make sound and i i think you have something to maybe demonstrate some some sounds that the elk make <laughs> all right 
and maybe talk a little bit about that. Definitely makes sound. And they're actually elk in relation to other members of the deer family are really social. They like being in groups. They can often be in really some pretty large groups. We have at times on the ranch, uh, we'll have a single group of uh, three to 400 elk all in, all in, in the same group. And so uh, they don't mind being with company. And that's a lot of times, especially the cow elk, they tend to prefer being with other elk. Bull elk are a little different and you can kind of chuckle about this with like humans because sometimes guys just, you know, want to hang out together and that's kind of what bull elk tend to do. They get in groups that are just all males and they'll spend the winter together. Um, and then they tend to spend most of the, of the year with their older bulls in groups, either by themselves or in groups of other males until the rut. And then they kind of come back in and, uh, and mix up again with all the cow groups. But <clears throat> cow groups or cows, has something that we call, it's kind of like a muse sound. They make sounds for a lot of different reasons, uh, but it sounds kind of like this. And so that's sort of a way that they communicate to one another. Um, they also have a sound that's an alarm sound. It's almost like a bark, like a dog, and they'll, so, and when they're disturbed or they're alerted some way, they'll make this shrill bark, and uh, that gets everybody else's attention that something's up. And so yeah, they definitely do talk. Um, bull elk, on the other hand, they'll they can mew and they can do those kind of things. But during the rut, they start to have this thing called a bugle, and in a lot of cases, it's sort of a challenge to the other bulls and. Um, so it's one way to actually attract elk when you're hunting them during the rut is you can imitate what a cow elk and a bull elk sound like with these calls, but a uh, uh, elk bugle might sound something like this. And so they, <laughs> they can get really active with that and, and you can hear all kinds of different bulls during the rut make that sound across the landscape. Uh, but it's really a kind of a unique sound for the deer family. And um, it also makes, if you haven't had a chance to go out and go to somewhere like Slippery Ann in the, uh, in the Missouri breaks or in Yellowstone Park or somewhere where they're rutting and just be able to watch and listen to it. It's, it's really fun to watch. Um, they're pretty, it's really fun to kind of observe uh, all the behavior and the sounds that they make when you rut. <laughs> okay well craig thank you so much we are out of time for this session today and we thank everybody for coming there are so many questions still in the chat that we have not even touched so we will try to go through those at the end of the day and send an email out with some of those answers but you guys are awesome and thank you so much for joining us thank at you all very much beautiful mpg ranch okay everybody have a great day